We are back here on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast and joining us now, a guy who I've wanted to talk to for a long time. And we finally have him on the show. Of course, he spent 18 years at UCF as uh, initially the quarterbacks coach and offensive coordinator, and then later the head coach. Put through a lot of players through the N- into the NFL from UCF. And of course, for the last decade, has been the head coach at Trinity Prep. Uh, where he has seen another a, a fair number of UCF players come and go his way uh, as well. Uh, a familiar face and a familiar name to a lot of UCF fans, including myself. When, and when I was a student, he was the head coach. And uh, I'm glad to be talking with him again. Mike Kruzek joining us here on the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Happy, happy holidays, Coach. Merry Christmas. How are you? Happy holidays to you too, Jeff. I'm doing fantastic. I really am. It's good to see you. Um, you look great, you know, but I, I, we uh, and I guess, uh, you know, we know the stories. Right. But I think some of our audience, you know, it, it, as time goes by, we tend to forget a lot of the history that goes on with UCF. And you were there for so many incredible moments that led to the led to where we are now. And it's such an interesting time in the history of UCF. But, uh, you know, your initial claim to fame as a player was. Uh, was playing was playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers as a quarterback behind Terry Bradshaw, and uh, you know you're you originally from the Washington D.C. area, but you went to school at Boston College. So let's pick it up there. How does a guy from uh, from B.C. end up playing for, playing alongside the famed Steel Curtain and uh, all those Hall of Famers in the uh, during the Pittsburgh Steelers Super Bowl run? Uh, great question. <laughs> Sometimes I still wonder why. But um, I was blessed to be drafted in the second round. And, um, you know, they had Bradshaw and they had Terry Hanratty from Notre Dame and Joe Gilliam. I mean, they had a a quarterback room that was very talented. So I was trying to question as to where I'm going to fit in this whole thing. But Coach Noel being Coach Noel had a plan and uh, everything kind of worked out pretty well. I played a lot as a rookie. Uh, had some great memories, played with some unbelievable guys, uh, incredible character people, talent, and went on to do some really, really good things as a team. So I was, I was very, very blessed to uh, play with the best and perhaps maybe the best that's ever been assembled in pro football. In, uh, in 1976, you had to step in for Terry Bradshaw uh, and – and you won all six of your starts. And there was a moment there when I think Chuck Knoll and probably the papers in Pittsburgh at the time thought, gee, this Kruzek guy might, might, might be giving us something that Terry might not take us back to that moment in your career. When you suddenly find yourself, you know, as the, as the starting quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers um, and winning ball games and keeping them in a position to get to the playoffs in a season that was a very difficult season for that. I think a lot of people forget that in 1976, it was right after they won their first two of four Super Bowls and uh, a lot of injuries at the time, but you kept the raft afloat. Well, again, just tremendously blessed to be a part of this whole team. Um, it was the fifth game of the year. We were playing Cleveland, who's our arch rival, I'll put it that way, up in Cleveland. And uh, I hadn't played a snap uh, up until that point. Uh, got very few reps in practice. I was always running scout team. I had two quarterbacks. Coach Snow got rid of Terry Hanratty and Joe Gilliam, so it was just Terry and I. So he goes down, Turkey Jones slams him into the turf, and I, I thought he was very, very, very seriously hurt. And you've got 80,000 fans in Municipal Stadium, the old Cleveland Stadium, going crazy because now they've put out the star guy. But um, I got in and we went down and scored. I think we went 80 yards for a touchdown, but it was too little too late. We got beat. So we ended up being one and four. And I think it really, and I say this because I had very little to do with, except manage a football game to do with these victories. During my time as a quarterback, the defense woke up. I mean, when you go down across the defensive line, the linebackers in the secondary, they're all Hall of Fame people. They had five shutouts during that period of time. It was unheard of. 
I mean, it was all he had to do was kick a field goal. So Chuck knew that. We kept the ball on the ground. We had Rocky and Franco and 2,000-yard rushers and Swan Stallworth outside, Frank Lewis. Uh, just a great football team. And um, I think with Terry getting hurt really woke everybody up and say, listen, we just got finished beating Dallas in the Super Bowl, and now we're one and four. We got to do something down this stretch, and we did. So it was uh, it, it was great to be a part of that whole thing. Probably the biggest memories of my life come from that season, along with being a part of the Super Bowl team and the experience, the winning the game. Uh, you know, after winning the Super, after being in the Super Bowl. There's a lot of mystique that still surrounds that team and those Pittsburgh teams to, for, to this day, you know, winning four Super Bowls in six years. But when you think of your personal interactions with guys like Lynn Swan, John Stallworth, Franco Harris, Rocky Blyer, um, guys on the defense like Mean Joe Green, and Mel Blunt and Elsie Greenwood, you know, what what are some of the things that you remember recall the most about you know just being in the locker room with those guys who folks like us lionize for their achievements on the field well first of all they were tremendously supportive you know when I had to step into play uh I mean I can't say enough about these guys character and and, and believing in me and encouraging me not everything went great but they were always had my back and you're talking about the best of the best and I idolize those guys too now. I mean, I was in college watching them win Super Bowls when I was at BC, and then all of a sudden now I'm thrust into playing with these guys, and they're just regular guys. They're just <laughs> – I don't know that I can say it any different. Uh, team had tremendous belief in the collective talent of the group, and regardless of who had to step up and play, that was going to happen. And I remember being in the huddle and – I'd throw a pass to uh, Swanee and he'd drop the ball and he'd come back and I'd joke with him. I'd go, listen, you catch Bradshaw's balls. Why don't you catch mine? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was kind of that way. I, I, I didn't seem to miss a beat from college and the confidence and attitude going into an NFL huddle, especially the Steeler huddle, and obviously having the success we did have. But when you have a defense that stout during that time, it was easy to win games. And we did. We won the next uh, six games. I think we ended up 10 and four that year going into the playoff game against the Colts. Yep. Nine in a row to finish out the regular season that year. Yeah, which is kind of a hard thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it went really, really well. And it was really a special time. Go ahead, Bryson. You mentioned, of course, I mean, Jeff mentioned a lot of the names and of course, Terry Bradshaw among them as well. That it, that's Hall of Fame talent up the wazoo on that entire team. So how did playing with them with so many people that are now enshrined in Canton impact you coaching wise and how you approach coaching a football team? Well, I think that they had an impact, obviously, because but you're talking about an uh, elite group of guys, talent wise, personality wise, character wise. Uh, but really, you know, Chuck Noll had a big impact on my coaching career. Uh, he was the <laughs> this sounds funny. He was the quarterback coach. He was an offensive lineman for the Browns when he played. Mm -hmm. So he handled the quarterback meetings. And the quarterbacks, at least for the Steelers in those days, called plays for themselves. It wasn't signaled in. There was no head mic. There was nothing. So uh, he did a great job on the mental aspect of approach of the game and, and, and how we uh, down and distance teams. And that had a, a great effect on who I was as I moved along uh, out of playing in my coaching career. So – but they all had, you know, work ethic wise and watching practice on the field and how hard they went. They understood that the way you practice, the way you're going to play. There was no time off. And in those days, unlike today, and I'm not saying it's bad. I mean, we were we were going live on uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. I mean, it, it was pads and we were hitting each other. Whereas today, people are worried about injury and this and that. They kind of tag off and all that. Not that the the hitting has dropped off, but it was a, a different time, very special time. So, but it all had a big impact on my career being with that organization. Yeah, it is a lot different. Okay. But you got to answer me one question here, coach Kruzak. Mm -hmm. How does a guy who calls his own plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers somehow not throw a touchdown pass? Okay. <laughs> you asked that question. 
Terry Bradshaw called his own plays. Ah. I did not. So, and now let me clarify this stuff. Now, I knew this question was going to come up. <laughs> I think I was 51 of 84, whatever. Uh, I had more pass completions stopped on the one yard line than you can believe in. I was going to say, because I <laughs> looked right, on man. YouTube and I found some highlights with John Facenda narrating them and all from NFL films. And there must have been three or four of them where some, where Stallworth got pulled down at the one or something. I'm like, how did this, how did they not get in? This is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, again, it's not about statistics with me, although, you know, I supposedly had this uh, uh, good career doing playing quarterback with the Steelers and never threw a touchdown. It's about winning games. Um, Franco had an incredible year. Obviously, once we cut down inside the five, we were running the football. So, and I knew that, and I was fine with all that. It's my job was just to get them down there to try and assist and, you know, work out the game plan and execute. So, it was all good. Uh, not throwing a touchdown. That was, I think, back golly. I mean, you had a lot of snaps. <laughs> it just didn't work out. Well, you played five years. You finished your NFL career with one year in Washington, playing back in your home in, in your hometown. You actually did start a game in Washington. I think it was in Dallas. Is that right? No. Oh, it wasn't. Okay. Joe Theismann got hurt uh, probably at the end of the third quarter, and I went in to play. Uh, it may have been sooner. Um my start was against the Falcons. Oh, okay. they, they were a playoff team that year. And, uh, you know, we got beat by a few points, but uh, they were a pretty good football team. Steve Barkowski was a quarterback at the time. I think it was, it was obviously 1980. So it was an interesting time, you know, when, you, when I, I look back and I compare the two teams and the personalities and my experiences – it was just different in Washington and it was with uh, Chuck Noll and the rest of those guys in Pittsburgh. I was under Pardee. Now I wasn't underneath Gibbs. So it was Jack's last year as a head coach at Washington. Right. right. So then you, your pro career, your pro career as a player comes to an end, but then you go into, uh, you decide to go into coaching. So how does an NFL quarterback with two Super Bowl rings land with a Division II school in Florida? Well, I have to start before I got to UCF because the reason why I ended up at UCF was because of an individual I coached with. Um, in 82, Coach Bowden hired me to coach the quarterbacks at Florida State. I, I got down there Valentine's Day, uh, 1982 in February, and worked there two years and made – some great acquaintances with the coaching staff, in particular Gene McDowell, mm -hmm. who eventually became the head coach, as we know, at UCF. Uh, I left there and went to the Jacksonville Bulls to go back out and play in 1984 with Lindy Afondi, who was a he was a, a voted I mean coach of the year for the Packers. I mean he's been around, did a great job. He was another mentor offensively that I had, but I was only there one year, and then Gene called me about coming down to UCF. Now this was before it was like 84 December and I said okay because I'll let you run the offense and and uh we'll get this thing going I didn't do any research on UCF facilities nothing and I can remember driving on campus I, I remember the day it was January 5th and it was a gloomy Sunday and uh, we had a meeting that day our first staff meeting and I'm going what did you get yourself involved with coming down here? I'm serious. The facilities were non-existent. They were before you got to school, obviously. And uh, I remember the meeting room and how crowded it was. There, it, 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 people don't have a clue about where that school came from as compared to where it is right now. So that's how I ended up down there. Let me coordinate and coach the quarterbacks and spent 19 years there. So he was very influential in my career too although he was a defensive guy he never got in my business as an offensive coach so it was nice but, but it, was, it was kind of a good laboratory for you 
as a coach, right? Because I, I that's what I kind of liked about you know even all those years later as as a student, you know, we kind of had this because there was the sort of chip on your shoulder mentality of you know that comes with that. You had a lot of opportunities to you know, try some new things. And, you know, if something didn't work, okay, we'll try something else. Right. There, there was, there, there was a, I don't want to say that there wasn't pressure, but there certainly wasn't the kind of pressure that you would see at a place like Florida or Florida state at the time. Right. No, you're absolutely correct. Really was. I mean, we had a heck of a schedule uh, considering the lack of a budget that we had. I mean, there was absolutely none. And, uh, we were able to attract some really quality athletes because they just wanted to play football. They, they, back in those days, they really weren't interested in uh, facilities and, you know, being recognized. So we got a considering what we didn't have to offer, except an education and a chance to play some really good football players. And um, I can remember 1986, I going into 87, I lined up five wide receivers without huddling for four or five games. Poor running backs. You you talked about Gia Cohn and those guys, uh, Elgin Davis and, and uh, Aaron Sams. We had some really good running backs, and I just went five wides and let's go. Throw the ball. Uh, you know, I obviously changed later on. but it, uh, So you're right. It was a laboratory to experiment on things to give us a chance to beat the teams we were playing. Well, that was going to be my next question because a, a couple of years ago, I did speak to Darren Slack and he told me about the one team meeting that you had where you guys had gotten off to a slow start. Um, and, and everyone was kind of looking around the room saying, you know, this is a talented team. What's wrong. And you walked into the meeting room, took the binder in your hand and threw it in the trash and said, this is, we're, this is going away. This is what it's, this is what we're going to do. And that's kind of where, at, at least according to that story, the five wide scheme kind of was born out of almost necessity. Can you give us a little bit more insight into how that all went down? Well, actually it started at the end of 86. Obviously Darren was starting at the time and uh, we had won. And, but I saw a lot of potential in that scheme that was created. And it was really simplistic in communicating things, which is essential. Uh, as far as success. And so I continued it into uh, 87. And I, I, I think that uh, I remember the occasion where I don't know what I threw in the trash, but um, I told him, I said, listen, we're out of this plan. We're going to, we're going to go to empty and just throw it around the park a little bit. And, and Darren, you know, very smart guy, uh, mechanically very sound, had some really talented uh, wide receivers and it gave people problems. I mean, it really did. Now, you know, you had to be sound in your protections because it's an only a five man protection. So they can make you hot a lot if they're smart. <laughs> so <laughs> you had to work through that aspect of things because really in practice, we never worked on being hot, but there was a hot guy involved with the route. So it was uh, evolutionary for us. And uh, it was nice to have at the time. I know Darren had fun executing the plan. So. And, and that's, that I think was the the nexus of you being you know, developing a reputation that you that you got throughout your career as a coach, especially at UCF as an offensive innovator, because uh, and I can't help but think like how different the character was of it to go you know five wides and empty from a guy who played who who lined up as a player in front of Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris, right? I mean it's. It's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting how that worked, but what what did you when you really break down your offensive philosophy? What was really at the core of it, and how did you develop it over the course of nearly two dec nearly two full decades at UCF? It was really the influence of a number of people that I spoke about. Um, I talked about Chuck. Now we were <laughs> we were a two back two receiver tight end team. We we're 21 personnel all the way. So that was a different time in football. Everybody was basically that way. Mm -hmm. um, as we, as I evolved with coach Infante, now he was with the Bengals when they were in the Super Bowl, And um, he was a more of 11 personnel, three receivers tight end in the back. 
Now, we never went to empty. However, my knowledge expanded by being around him and how he called things and how he communicated things and how he coached it. And uh, then I went to UCF and I just looked at and evaluated the talent and going, you know what? We got guys on the bench that can make plays. I, we got to get them in the game. How do you do that? Well, so we came up with this, this five wide out thing and it worked for a long time. And then you know, we eventually went back with Darren Henshaw later on. We were more two back and, but we always had that, that plan, the ability to do that. So it was a, uh, I don't know that anybody specifically had an influence on doing it, but I, I know that Coach No, Coach Infani, Coach Bowden was a two-back guy too. Now when we were there, and uh, but he was he was a, a more of a, a mentor about life, and it wasn't so much about the X's and O's. It was about how to treat players and uh, cultivate relationships, and he was incredible that way. So it's, uh, I, again, I was tremendously blessed to be around some really great guys that helped form who I am and, you know, it worked out. Another one of those guys, <laughs> I'm sure helped form who you were as a coach was your boss, Gene McDowell at the time. We lost Gene last January, uh, January of 2021. Um, what did Gene mean to you? Well, First of all, we were very competitive with each other. When I was there, I was a big weightlifter, but I was an extremely talented racquetball player. And he thought he was a good racquetball player. And so we would play three days a week in the off season. And I don't think he ever beat me, but he, he, would, <laughs> he would get so mad. So this carried on going into UCF. So he had a visual, he had a, a vision for this program that I bought into when I got on campus because I saw what he went through and the sacrifices he made. Um, he allowed me to be me and not try and handcuff what we did, which I've always been tremendously thankful for and appreciative of, but uh, uh, he is, and I'll say it on this air, he's Mr. UCF. I don't, I know there's been a lot of people do some things, but when a guy takes a dollar salary for the entire year, because there's no money in the budget, You've got coaches working for Burger King uh, receipts to get a Whopper. I mean, it, it, it was amazing how he was able to hold that thing together and then raise money to try and, you know, sustain the program as it moved along. So uh, his work ethic and, and, and his willing to sacrifice a lot uh, really helped mold me. So. Through the <laughs> 80s, you guys moved up from D2 to 1AA, now FCS. Had a, incredible success there, built, building up to that win at Youngstown State over Jim Tressel, I believe, was the head coach at the time. He was. Uh, and it's uh, and, and still one of the most dramatic victories, I think, in UCF history that um, you know is, is easily forgotten because it was in, like, the before times. It was 1990. Oh, yeah. But – um, tell us about that that victory over over Youngstown State in that cold weather. Franco Grilla makes the field goal to win it at the end, but it was your guys' offense that kind of controlled the game and put UCF in a position to win that game. You know what? It's funny. We went up there. We were. I think we were. They take the sixteen top teams in the playoffs. They were one. We were sixteen. And nobody expected us, especially with the weather being so frigid for us to win. And all I did was run the ball. And I, I kept hearing, because I'm up in the box, you're going to have to throw the ball. You're going to have to throw the ball. No. We maintained possession of the ball by running it, a little bit of play action, you know, quick game stuff. And uh, one of the most memorable games I've ever been associated with because nobody gave us any chance to win the game. Yet we go up there in front of a packed stadium, Hall of Fame coach, a great football team, and, and win the game. So it uh, it was – and Franco, to me, is one of the greatest kickers that ever kicked at UCF. I mean, he was unbelievable. So he was money for us. We got – he, he was clutch. He was very, very clutch. So <laughs> – after that, in comes a, a quarterback we all know, Dante Culpepper. You coached him. You coached him for four seasons at Y. Well, describe to us, like, because I wasn't alive for 
that to to happen or at least wasn't alive long enough to really see him play and so can you just describe like uh, about you know he 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 recently came back to UCF and spoke with the team and kind of described it but from your perspective describe kind of who Dante was as a player and as a person and what he meant to this program well you really have to understand his background to really understand who Pep is and by the way I am elated that he came back to UCF um, I had a chance to be, coach him in his last professional game in the UFL with Denny Green in Sacramento. Uh, you know, going back to the recruiting process, Paul Lounsbury did an incredible job of, of, of uh, monitoring Dante, giving him a plan to get eligible <laughs> to get into college. And Dante is an extremely loyal guy. Everybody else fell off the wagon because they said, well, he's not going to make it. He's not going to make it. So they quit communicating with him, which I think upset Dante. But we, he came down to four games. It was unofficial. He drove down. Uh, he was raised by his, uh, his adopted mother, Emma, who was, I always say she's tougher than battery acid. She was a, she was a tough lady, but what a mother she was to him. And uh, and he was because he's who he is because of who she is, but loyal, uh, hardworking, uh, tremendous character guy. Never got in trouble. Went to class. Uh, just everything you want as a football player. And uh, I gave him every chance. We gave him every chance. I trying to put him in a position to be successful. Obviously, he had a tremendous career. Uh, you know, moving into the 1A level was, was a tough thing. Uh, you know, FBS level that Jeff talked about when we got there, uh, we're playing some pretty good football teams. But the games were always competitive because of his athletic ability and uh, everybody raised their uh, playing level simply because of who he was. Great guy. You never know he played football. Just a tremendous athlete. But the greatest thing about Pep was his confidence. There wasn't a thing you could say to him that he, that he said, I can do that. I can do that. I can remember at practice one day. He's a freshman, and obviously he's starting, and we had uh, backups in in practice, and he's standing next to me and goes, Coach, I can do a backflip. Now, we're in full equipment. I said, Pep, you probably can, but don't do it. <laughs> I turn around. I look in the feeder. His head's at the ground and the feet are going over the top. Standing backflip, full equipment. I've got tons of stories about telling him he can't do it. Well, guess what? Yeah, he can. So that's the way he approached life and the game. And uh, obviously he had a tremendous career. And I'll say this, if he hadn't tore his knee up uh, when he was at Minnesota, he may have gone down as one of the best ever played the game. He just... It just never recovered for him. So yeah. the thing I'm most proud of him is he's come back to UCF. You know, he got away from there for a long, long time. So he, he's, a, he's a big face of that program, regardless of what anybody says. Yeah, I, mean, I still think that's true. We, it, we here at UCF, we, you, you know, it's his place is secure. It's funny you mentioned that one story about the backflip, because I actually had a, a, a buddy of mine in the, in the radio business actually way back in the day told me a good story about him that, uh, that I think you'll appreciate. Uh, when he was a student at UCF, he took a, a team sports survey class, I think it, it, it might've been, it might've been taught by, um, by Torchy. Uh, back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but he said every, every class they would play a different sport, right? So, you know, it will be flag football one day. It'll be, you know, softball, another, whatever. He said, there was no sport Dante wasn't good at because we would go out there, play soccer on this one particular day. He would be flipping the ball back and forth between his feet, dribbling the soccer ball. Like he would, like he was Cristiano Ronaldo, like oh, weaving yeah. in and out of trap. We go play golf. He would drive the ball 300 yards. Um, it, it, he's, it, 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 and it, we almost talk about Dante, like, like he was Bo Jackson, you know, you, that documentary about Bo where they talk about all these crazy stories about him, like how incredible of a figure he was. And, and I think Dante was sort of the, uh, was the same way, 
in, yes. in a way. He was our Bo Jackson. Yeah. He really was. And uh, we were <laughs> at a time where we really needed somebody to get him was huge for this program as far as pushing it along and the success it had going into where it is right now. So uh, it was an honor to coach him. It really was. But, uh, just a great, great, great guy, as you know. Yeah. His final season, 1998, 9-2, and two, and barely miss out on a bowl game as a 1A independent at the time, which – you know, everyone likes to talk about how many bowl games there are. There's that there weren't that many back then, and you guys came so painfully close to going to, I believe, the Hawaii Bowl at the time. Um, tell us about that season and and the run that you guys went on, um, and how close it came. Like, what were the dominoes that fell that kept you guys out of? you know, grabbing that brass ring for the first time? Well, that, that season will live in my memory for forever. Um, we opened up the season at Louisiana Tech, and Tim Merte was a quarterback and uh, had a kid named, uh, I think it was Brown, that got drafted by the Steelers, and Merte got drafted. Had a tremendous, they had a tremendous year in 97, so we opened up out there, and this is my first game that happens to be on the road. Mm-hmm. We end up winning 64 to 30, and Pep throws four touchdowns. I mean, he's just – and I, we, I, had, I knew – I never went into a game not knowing that we couldn't win the game in the, the four years he was there. That'll say enough. It's all about the quarterback. Then we play Purdue up there, and uh, Joe Tiller was the head coach at the time. And I remember talking to him before the game. He goes, hey, coach, I'll trade you my team for yours. I, just, I go, coach, I think I'm going to hold on to my guys. Well, Drew Brees is his quarterback at the time. <laughs> so we're playing in the game. We are up and down the field. We turn the ball over three times inside their five-yard line. The only time I ever got upset at Dante, it was fourth down and two feet on the goal line, and I had a quarterback sneak call. Now, I always gave him the freedom to check. I should have gone, no check, no check. He checks to a pass, incomplete. They take the ball, so we don't score. We get down there again. He throws a pass. It goes through Charles Lee's hands. Mm. He's picked off on the eight, eight yards in the end zone, and they run it back for a touchdown. It was a ridiculous game, and uh, we had more yards than they had, but they beat us up substantially. After that, we went on this run, and we had a chance, and we gave this away against Auburn. Auburn, yeah. And if we win the game, we don't go to Hawaii. We go to freaking uh, the Liberty Bowl against Tulane, who's undefeated. Yeah, Sean King. Sean King. Yep. So we go in the game, and it, it really is on me. Dante had only thrown three interceptions up to that point. Now, mind you, this is the, the ninth or tenth game of the year, and uh, he throws four interceptions. Defense, you know, I had hired Chiswick that year as a defense coordinator, was lights out against that team. They couldn't, they couldn't move the ball an inch, and uh, so. And we had things open. It just, for some reason, we missed it. I should have run the ball more. But um, we're up 6-3 in the fourth quarter. It's They get a holding call on third down and 10, right? Mm-hmm. They're in their territory. Time's running down. I decline the penalty. Make it fourth and 10. Coach Chiz comes with a corner blitz, a cat, with our linebacker that side. We don't fit it out, and he hits the hot. So he throws a five-yard hitch. Our safety misses, and he goes 60 yards for a touchdown. Yeah, we get the ball back with a minute something, and we don't we don't, we're not able to drive down. So we lose 10 to 6. Unheard of. And that game will always be in my mind, too, because – then there won't be any noise about, well, they didn't go to bowl game until this year and that year. Ah, 
you can say what you want. During my years, out of the six years I coached there, we would have been in a bowl game five times, four times, based on today's standards. But that season was fantastic, uh, except for <laughs> that Auburn game. So that will live with me for a long time. It, it was the first uh, year of the BCS, if I'm not mistaken. It was. And the way it worked out, uh, Kansas, I think it was Miami was playing UCLA in the Orange Bowl in a game that was delayed because of a hurricane. They were supposed to play it in September. Right. They got moved back. So, and then Miami upsets Caden McNown and UCLA at that time. And Edron James, I think, ran for 300 yards in that oh, game. Oh, was I remember. absurd. Yeah, oh, wow. and, then, and then later that day, and I think the the second Big 12 champ, second or third Big 12 championship game, Texas A&M knocks off number two Kansas State, a team with, I, I think it was Michael Bishop was on Kansas State at the time. They were right. really good. Yep. They get knocked off by, I remember Sir Parker scored the touchdown in overtime. Twin, and that drops everybody down a peg and knocks you guys out of a bowl game, which is, you know, which looking back on it's like, you gotta be kidding me how, how that, how that all went down. And now we have 58 bowl games that we, that, you know, we could have gone to, it would have been, it would have been a layup nowadays. Well, yeah, it is you know, it, half the time they're looking for teams that are 500 to try and get to fill these bowl spots. Right. You know, they just, they, they weren't enough bowl games back then. And, and rightfully so. I mean, it has to be something that you earn and it's a, they get guys in the bowl where they're five and seven because they can't get enough teams to play in it. So that was the times and that's the way it goes. And, uh, but we, we had some good teams. We had some great players and some great moments. I want to do a little rapid fire with you here. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's okay. All right. Um, what was your, if I have to force you to pick one, is 1998 your best team or favorite team at UCF? Yes. Okay. Um, what was your favorite game that you ever coached at UCF? Oh, favorite game. Now that's, that's a tough question. Um, I got a lot of them, if you <laughs> No, no, that's good. Uh, possibly the first one against Louisiana Tech simply because it was my first one and we never expected to beat this team by 34 points the way we did Yeah, uh, yeah. with a, a fairly new staff, a new defensive coordinator, uh, you know, obviously a new head coach. Um, that sticks in my mind um, as a head coach, yes. That probably was, was one of the biggest uh, – you know, 2002 was a special year, too, with Snyder at quarterback. We did some really, really good things. You know, not enough credits given to him and the group that played that year with Doug Gabriel and, you know, Gaines and the guys that we had playing on the team at the time. They kind of get lost in the shovel. But uh, um, the Louisiana Tech was probably the most memorable game for me right now because, again, it was the first game I had coached in. Yeah, I'm going to get to 2002 in a second too. But I want to give you, I want to give you an opportunity to give us a little name association. I'm going to say a name, okay? And you give us one or two words about about those particular players or people that I mentioned. You ready? I'm going to try. All right, here we go. Doug Gabriel. Uh, confident. Uh. Tremendously talented, physical. Asante Samuel. <laughs> Again, I'm going to use the word uh, tremendously confident, uh, incredibly instinctive. Uh, Jimmy Frizzell. Tenacious, overachieving. Uh, again, someone that believed in his own ability to play. Vic Penn. 1999. Uh, I'm going to use the word. Ah, uh, geez. I don't, I can't, I don't have one word to describe him. 
he came in in a situation where he was a JC quarterback and had to learn how to drop back and pass because he was a sprint quarterback in JC out of Miami and would far surpass anything I thought he could do during that season. Now, again, I'm going past what you allowed me to say. <laughs> That's okay. But when you consider he had to start against Purdue at home, second game, go to Florida. The next game, play Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next game, play Georgia. Oh, don't get me started on that Georgia game. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then Auburn later on during the season. So a remarkable job by him. Again, I think he had great confidence in his own ability to play and, and uh, you know, had a lot of athleticism. He was fast. He could throw the ball. So it was, we were very fortuitous to get him when we did after Dante left. Javier Berlegi. Clutch. Yeah. <laughs> it did a great job. I mean, when you punt and you kick, that's a talent. Yeah, and I mean, you don't see guys who do who pull double duty like that anymore. No, no. They specialize in just one skill. Um, but he did a tremendous job the years he was there. And obviously the kick at Alabama was huge. But he made a lot of big kicks. Uh, you know, the Georgia game was unfortunate. He was sick the night before and – you know, uh, but his career was phenomenal. Darren Hinshaw. Studious, talented, motivated, intelligent, uh, and tremendously competitive. Um, Matt Prater. Matt. <laughs> Just watched him last night. I know. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say <clears throat> unique, and I'll say it from this standpoint. We had never scholarshiped a kicker coming out of high school in the years I was at UCF, not as an assistant, not as a head coach. And he was that talented coming out of the Naples area down there. I think it was a sterile. Yeah. Uh, and to last like he's done right now is, is a, a credit to him and keeping his body in shape and always had a tremendous leg. You know, remember Penn State, his first field goal was 52 yards yeah. uh, in the opener. And, uh, again, another kid that uh, UCF benefited from that someone overlooked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I remember he was – because I was a student at the time as a student reporter, I remember seeing – at the time, it was it was a he was in a competition with, uh, with uh, uh, Ryan Feely, who was the little brother of Jay Feely, right? And and we thought, well, Feely, right? I mean, he's a Feely. He's probably going to be pretty good. And he beat him out. And we're like, this guy Prater must be something. And then he hit that fifty three yarder at Penn State in Happy Valley in front of one hundred and ten thousand people. And you're like, man, like we got nothing. something here. Yeah. Oh yeah. And he uh, ended up our punter. Right, we, right. We, we, did, we were rugby style back then, trying to protect him, let him – because the swing is different when you punt and you kick. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when you're soccer style, you, you sweep across it. When you punt, your leg's straight up and down. So we said, well, let's put the rugby punt in and let him hit it. And he did a tremendous job doing that. So, All right, I got, I got, an, I got three really good ones for you coming up. Okay. Oh, uh, you've had some good ones now. Rick Stockstill. Uh, my buddy. I, 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 a critical piece that people don't understand how important he was to the program. A tremendous recruiter. Uh, he was a player's guy. I mean, did a great job with uh, the receivers. I mean, when you consider he coached Sean Jefferson, he coached Sean Becton. I mean, it was a who's who. Bernard Ford, you look through the, the receiver records at UCF, he had a bunch of them, but it was his personality and character that separated him from a lot of coaches. Just a phenomenal guy, and he hasn't changed to this day. And he's yeah. had a tremendous career at Middle Tennessee. Stay in touch with him quite often. So, uh, yeah, he's been the head coach at Middle Tennessee since 2006, still going. Have uh, you, you ever talked to him? I haven't. I've, he's on my list. He's uh, he's on my list of guys to talk to. But you need, it's you need to call him. I gotta he'll, get him. He'll, he'll he'll tell you about the times back when we started. He was on the staff when we came to That's UCF right. in two thousand five. 
Gene hired all the, the young guys from Florida State, mm-hmm. right, that wanted to coach. Yep. Gene knew that he didn't have to pay him a lot of money. <laughs> but he'll tell you some stories yeah. <laughs> that will be hysterical. You mentioned a couple of those wide receivers you were talking about. Sean well, Jefferson. There you go. Uh, extremely proud of, of, of Sean. I mean, here's another kid that was extremely athletically talented, incredibly confident in his ability to do things, um, and just came up big in games. Um, you see him in hard knocks. You watch him on the sideline with the Cardinals. You know about his son. That's who Sean was. And he didn't have the, the, the easiest upbringing either. So he overcame a lot to get to where he's at. And that's a credit to him and his uh, belief in his ability and God, that you know, things will work out. So it was great to have Sean. I could tell you stories, but I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, Sean Becton. He was Mr. Consistent. He, he, he did everything well. He could catch, run, throw, punt, return. I mean, he did everything. Smart, intelligent, diligent, hardworking, great work ethic, uh, always in class, never had to worry about it. Great, great, great guy. All right, I got uh, two more, and these are good ones. And you mentioned him earlier. Ryan Schneider. Very, very confident. Uh, played with a chip on his shoulder because no one recruited him. Mm. And he was a 7A player of the year. I forget what A it was, but he was a player of the year in Plantation. Yep, Plantation. <laughs> and uh, uh, I couldn't believe we got him as late as we got him. Um, productive, smart. I think his biggest quality is just toughness. He, he was a hit. tough cookie, man. Oh, oh he, he was. He was off the charts tough. I mean, he took some vicious hits and get right back up. He'd be looking through his ear hole. Are you all right? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I mean, I can remember the Alabama game, and we get the ball back on that, that drive where Bolega kicked the field goal. He comes to the sideline, and it's like 55 seconds left. He goes, Coach, we got this. <laughs> and he goes, tick, 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 field goal. I mean, that's who he was. That's how he yeah. played in there. That Alabama game, and I and I do have to ask you. I mean, I'm that's probably I'm guessing that's the part that you remember the most is that final it is, drive. It, it, it is, and, and I, I mentioned Louisiana Tech, but I, I, this is how old I'm getting. The Alabama game had to be the highlight of my coaching career at, yeah. at UCF. I mean, we had come so close over a number of years. Of uh, we lost to Ole Miss in overtime when Gene was a head coach, and I had the perfect play called and. At a quarterback draw, and Dante doesn't take three steps. I should have been in the gun. He takes a step and a half, and he starts forward. I emptied the backfield with motion, and they were in two-man, and there's only a four-man rush, and he gets stopped a foot before he got to the goal line. Uh, Mississippi State's the same thing that year. You know, Nebraska was a good game. We just ran out of steam uh, in the second half. We just didn't have enough players. Uh, you know, Penn State, we lost 27-24 where we had a chance, um, and then – Obviously, the, the the Auburn game, the Georgia game, uh, the, and and the one you don't think about is Georgia Tech. Uh, right. I mean, we throw a reverse pass coming off the goal line, and Kenny Clark's got the ball smoking to the goal line. And the guy punches it out, and then they get it and drive it down uh, to score late in the game. And George Gotsy was a quarterback at the time for for O'Leary, right. and O'Leary was that coach. Yeah. Oh yeah. So there, 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 there's a number of uh, high-profile games that we played close. So beating Alabama was huge. I mean, especially on homecoming and, you know, Bear Bryant and the, his legend and beautiful day and great crowd. And kids played incredibly well, tremendously confidently. They never doubted they could win. Last one for you, last little name association, Brandon Marshall. <laughs> smiling he, he uh and again i'm gonna talk longer than you want that's okay we recruited brandon he was a single wing quarterback at lake Howell, and uh 
he was being recruited by Florida as a, just like Doug Gabriel. They wanted to play him as free safety. I said, no, man, you're a wide receiver. What, what are they talking about? So we get him, and I, I told him back when he was a freshman, I said, listen, if you can get your speed down below 4'6", you're going to make a lot of money in this National Football League. Now, I only had him, I had him two years, I think. Yeah. 2002 and then 2003, after I left. Right. And obviously, George moved him and Mike Walker, another one that was extremely talented, to safety. And I was in Arizona with the Cardinals. I'm going, what is he thinking? And then they moved him back, which is where they belonged, obviously, and went on with their careers. But uh, tremendously talented athlete now, basketball player, do everything athletically. Uh, just a happy-go-lucky kid at the time. I really didn't get to spend enough time, unfortunately, with him to really, really get to know him. But played big for us when he had to as a young player. Yeah. We just recently, uh, I think it was, a, I think it was about 10 years ago, the other day was the anniversary of uh, him setting a new NFL record for catches in a game. He had 21 catches. Oh yeah. I, I coached against him when he was at Denver. Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine. No. Uh, okay. The, uh, uh, so after your time at UCF ended in 2003, you come back to the NFL and right. Dennis Green hires you in Arizona. Right. What was it like being in the NFL now in the 2000s? You know, tw- uh, you know, some 15 years after you played, it's a different league, right? So what was that like coaching in the NFL at that point? Well, you know, I only knew the NFL as a player, not, not a, as a coach and what was involved with the coaching aspect of it. Obviously, I'd gone through coaching in college. Um, I love the National Football League coach. I mean, I absolutely, I had a tremendous mentor in Denny Green. Uh, absolutely love the guy. Players coach. Um, the schedule was a little different. Obviously, the thing that made it different, other than being in the National Football League, is we're in Arizona. We're freaking in Phoenix, and it's a billion degrees out, so we have to practice it. 8.30 in the morning, which means the guys are up lifting weights at 5.30. So, you know, and they're done by, you know, 1.30 in the afternoon. So I had to readjust the schedule, but it was very similar as far as structure is concerned. Uh, you know, perpetual hours as a coach, just what it was. I couldn't have asked for a better location with a better group of guys with Kurt Warner, Larry Fitzgerald, Edwin James, Anquan Bolden. I mean, it, it was... It was a joy to have an opportunity to work with those professionals that were not only great athletes, but even better people. So, Denny Green was also, you know, like you mentioned, but another guy gone too soon. Oh, I know. It, it, he had a circulation issue and he always walked around the field, you know, to, to stimulate. And he wore those high white stockings to mm-hmm. try and keep pressure on his, his legs and uh, I was heartbroken when he passed away. Just a tremendous. He and his wife, and my wife and myself, would go to dinner, you know, two or three times a year. And uh, fantastic person, incredible musician too, by the way. Right, he was really a good drummer, wasn't he? Yeah, Sunset Band. I mean, I have the I have the DVD. I mean, they were <laughs> they were very very. Doc Severson played with him. That's right. John, John, Johnny Carson's old guy. So no, great. Great person to learn under. Uh, players love playing for him. Um, you know, we didn't, in the ownership's mind, win enough games. I don't. I think Denny just got a little tired of butting heads with the Bidwells. Mm-hmm. And uh, he just said, you know, the heck with it. Kind of walked away from it. The, um, <laughs> the thing that I, I think about with that time is also, and I'm kind of struck by this, like, can you speak on how different how the NFL game has also evolved over the years? Because you know, like I mentioned, you played in the '70s with the Steelers, and there are entire sections of the NFL rulebook that were rewritten because of arguably one guy who was a teammate of yours, Mel Blunt, and not to mention all your other defensive teammates on this on the Steel team. And then you come to the NFL you know, as a coach, 
and it's a much more wide open passing league. Describe for us really the different, you know, the how the league evolved over that period of time from when you were a player to when you became a coach in the NFL. Well, I, I think the inability of the defensive back to get his hands on receivers past five yards had a lot to do with opening up the pass game. Mm -hmm. uh, but the game changed so much more than just that aspect of things. Uh, the NFL Players Association got heavily involved with how you structure practice, how much hitting you can do, uh, how many days in pads you can uh, have them in. Uh, Off-season training was limited. Now there, there is none, hardly. Uh, back in the day, our guys were in starting in March, and they were there the whole year off-season lifting. Now, uh -uh. So there's a lot more control by the Players Association on what can be done and what can't be done. Uh, they've cut the preseason down to, what, three games? Three games. <laughs> you know, it's something that I had agreed with to add another game during the season that means something because that fourth game was nothing. I mean, guys weren't playing anyway. Right. It was the same way when I played. Um, our last preseason game of the year, we – beat Dallas was against Dallas down in Dallas and they get they beat us 30 to nothing <laughs> I got knocked out on the last play of the game in the end zone uh -huh. so it, it was just they've done some really good things to uh, eliminate injury and it's all predicated on guys staying healthy um, I think that they do a remarkable job now of, of, of monitoring the hitting the game is still a heavy contact sport, obviously, and uh, but they don't work on that skill. You can't see it in the game because you can still see the viciousness of the hits you used to have, but uh, uh, they really control that so that players stay healthy. So the, the practice has changed tremendously. Um, and philosophically, what they do offensively with the wide receivers and throwing the football has changed, um, which makes sense to some degree, but you still got to run the football to win. Cut and dry. You can't just drop and throw. <laughs> it doesn't work. So, and the other issue is the hitting aspect. You talked about my teammates. I play with Mike Webster. Yeah. yeah. What happened to him had a dramatic effect on what's going on with young football. No doubt. Plus, no plus, doubt. It, it, parents aren't. You know, they're a little shaken up about all that, about the, the head injuries and whatnot. And, but Mike is a unique – he played 17 years. He led with his head every play, you know, so it's, it was a, just a tremendous guy too. Mike was quiet and a uh, tremendously talented guy. Just, he helped Bradshaw call plays. You know? mm -hmm. so. it, it, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because and, – and we'll get more to your – to your experience at Trinity in a little bit, but you deal with that now as a coach talking with, I, I, I imagine you must have a lot of conversations with parents saying, you know, look, I, you know, I, I, maybe my kid is talented, but I'm concerned about head injuries. How do you approach that? Well, it's, it, it's a difficult subject to try and uh, convince parents that, the game has changed. Tackling has changed. It's more of a rugby tackle now if you've watched the game. Mm -hmm. um, the head is not involved with it. Does the head get involved at times? Yeah. Does your head hit the ground, which causes concussion? Yes. Um, and yes, we do have this constant conversation with parents that are very concerned about uh, their, their children, their sons, uh, you know, getting concussions. But again, Mike and Dewerson and uh, Seau and the guys that were in the movie were mm -hmm. uh, unique, exceptional uh, athletes that, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> especially Mike. Yeah. Uh, I had just seen him prior to this happening. About six months, we had a reunion and uh, before he passed away. So... It's a tough, tough thing for us to overcome because training is a little different in public schools. The motivation for 
kids are a little bit different now. You know, right. it's not like they they need football to get out of the environment they're in. Our kids are a little bit different culturally, so it's we're up and down with things and always trying to. We got kids walking the hallway that can play. It's just trying to convince them and the parents that they need to play this game because it's more unique than any other sport that they can play. And I honestly feel that. And I'm sure that there's some kids who come to you and they're like, coach, I would, I would love to play for you, except, you know, X, Y, and Z, or, and I think this is, I don't, I'm interested in how you deal with it as a coach, like with the players that you have, because You know, I'm sure you've come across many instances where you see a kid take a shot and and he and and you he wants and he comes to you and he's like, coach, I'm I'm fine. I'll get back in. And you and you have to be the one to say, no, I this does there's something wrong. And and I think you need to get checked out. Come on out. And and that's that's a hard balance to strike, I would imagine, as a coach, because, you know, you're trying to balance the ability to win the game, obviously, with right. keeping your players safe and safe. Well, the, 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 the number one responsibility I have is keeping players safe. It's not about wins and losses, especially in high school level. You yeah. know, the NFL make a big to-do with that, obviously, and that's well-documented about getting back to Mike Webster and the days in the NFL and said, well, there's no concussions. Well, that's <laughs> not true. <laughs> so... Uh, we're very, very, very uh, cautious about hits. I uh, have a great trainer, and uh, there are signs, you know, after a hit, because we keep an eye on the young man. If he's not on the ground and he gets up and he's, he seems like he's just a little bit disoriented, then we'll sub him and get him off the field. And, and I am absolutely 100% behind whatever decisions made to because I don't, I ultimately make the decision, but the trainer's the one that says he doesn't, we can't go back out there. So we've been good with that and uh, and been very fortunate with it. But it is a subject that everybody has to, you know, uh, be a part of as, if you're a responsibility. My, my big thing is we don't hit during practice. Well, that's good and bad because the only time they hit's in the game. <laughs> right. So right. It doesn't work out too well. So uh, they do learn in, in training camp, but after that, it's kind of, you know, thud and touch and all that kind of stuff till they, the bullets are live on Friday night. A little different than when it was at UCF or whatever. You know, we had a, we had a lot of numbers then. I don't have a lot of numbers over Trinity. So right. a little different. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right, so I want to go back to when your time in the NFL came to a conclusion, but you still kept on coaching for a couple years. You worked with Matt Ryan, who went to your alma mater, Boston College. I did. And and also Brady Quinn, who went to your alma mater's rival, Notre Dame, of course. Uh, And uh, and and you kind of, you know, dove in as sort of like a quarterback guru for those two guys. What was that like? It was a lot of fun. It was in Scottsdale and. my uh, it was an agent that I had played football with, Tommy Condon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I played with him at BC, uh, who was representing both of those guys at the time. And he had called me, and uh, both unique guys, different in a lot of ways, uh, but nonetheless dedicated to becoming the best they could be. And we worked four days a week probably five hours a day. It was a combination of watching film, uh, talking about schematics and terminologies uh, that they may learn and then working those on the field. So it was, it was, it was great working with Matt and Matt uh, and Brady at the time. So Matt's had a tremendous career. Brady's didn't last quite as long. Brady was a big weight guy. He was slapped together. And I'm not saying Matt didn't train, but he was just a different body type. You know, but uh, I had a lot of fun with those guys. They were great to be around. And then the receivers that were a part of the IMG group over there were really good too. So um, that was that was that was nice. I enjoyed my time in in Phoenix. I really did. That uh, 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 you talk about Matt Ryan in particular. I had the good fortune of covering the one game that he won at Clemson 
with a late oh, yes. touchdown pass. I'm sure you were, I'm sure you recall seeing that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was on the sideline working for a TV station uh, in that area at the time and thinking, oh boy, this guy's is advertised. Someone's oh, yeah. going to, some, he's going to be around a while. <laughs> oh yeah. Very, very, very talented guy. And he has been around, you know, he's having a tough year this year. Uh, I kind of wish he had stayed in Atlanta or, you know, guys that establish a relationship with the team and their legacy with a team. Uh, I've always had an issue about why would you leave? You know, Montana did it with San Francisco, went to Kansas City. That worked out okay. Uh, Namath did it with New York, went to San Diego. I mean, it, it, there's hundreds of examples as to why you don't leave. Just retire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Second like done though. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I always thought like, you know, if I was if I was ever in that position, I'd be like, you'd have to drag me off that field. I mean, it, and it, it's you know, because it's it's such a it's it's such a gift. You know, it, oh, it really is a gift. And, yeah. uh, and and similar to that. And and I wanted to talk to you about this because I thought this was pretty interesting. You know, uh, Denny Green in uh, 2010 brings you back with the Sacramento Mountain Lions of the UFL. Now, there was a team in Orlando, but uh, you coached there for, I believe, two years. And you got to coach. Dante Culpepper, once again, in 2010, as he was finishing out his professional playing career with Sacramento, what was that like playing, you know, coaching Dante again, 12 years after you had coached him in college, uh, alongside the coach that he also played for as a professional in Dennis in Minnesota? What was, what was that like? Well, first of all, the UFL was very competitive. It was three years, 90 2009 to 2011, and Dante was with us in 10. To have an opportunity to have a chance to coach Dante alongside his greatest mentor and Denny Green uh, meant the world to me, and it did to Denny too. Um, he had We had a, a real good season. Now, we didn't win it. We beat the Tuskers twice. Mm-hmm. We're talking about Gruden and that group that were here, which was a pure joy for me. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell it was. <laughs> I got to tell you a story now. We're talking. Go for it. All right. I talked about the play that I had called against Ole Miss in '97. It was a quarterback draw. Right. Yep. Three-step quarterback draw. Yeah. I should have had him in the gun, but we were more in the center than in the gun. Then came up short. We got the same situation in the Citrus Bowl against the Tuskers, and it's fourth down. He comes to the sideline with Denny sitting next to me. He goes, Coach, run a bleeping quarterback draw. And I looked at him. I go, really? (laughs) He called a score touchdown. We won. Was he like, I'm taking three steps this time? (laughs) Yeah, he was in the gun. No, he he wasn't. (laughs) They had no chance at all. So it was kind of ironic that we were in the same situation, obviously at a different time with Coach Green and myself, and we're both standing there, although Denny probably didn't understand the the uh, me laughing and, and asking him, are you kidding? <laughs> it was right on the money with it, though. So. You know, I, I, I always have a soft spot for, for developmental leagues like the UFL was and like, we, well, like we've seen in recent years with the AAF and with the XFL and, and with the, the rejoinder of the USFL. And you, you said something I thought was pretty interesting is that, you know, because there are because the NFLPA has, has negotiated so many limits on reps, basically, for pro players that I feel and, and also um, – Someone else mentioned to me something interesting is that, you know, the college environment now is much less of a developmental environment because the coaches have to win now. Right. So they're not quite as predicated on developing players to play professional ball. Do you feel like, you know, we really need like a, like a developmental professional league for guys to serve as a bridge from college to the NFL? Well, I I think it's, is a, is a great tool uh, to help these guys improve their skill level out of college. 
the issue becomes the NFL is not interested in sec secondary leagues. Yeah, they don't want to fund it. They're not going to. They did initially with the World League. Yep. And they, they lost their, their shirt. And there was no really production because of it, you know, as far as players coming back to the league. I think that there has been proof that these secondary leagues, whether it be the USFL when it first started or the uh, XFL or UFL or whatever, the AA, whatever that was in, <laughs> there's a lot of players that do have an opportunity to get picked up by NFL teams that actually make the team. Yeah. So uh, the NFL just sits back and waits for these kids to come clean and come, you know, finish the season. And if they need them, then they pick them up. But the issue becomes money. You know, people aren't going bottom line is an investor wants to make his money back. There's not, uh, I'm going to, you know, try and be a real good guy and see these guys improve and take a hit financially. It's just mm -hmm. not going to work. But, uh, you know, you've got the uh, USFL now going in the second year and it seems like it's uh, fairly stable. Some good football teams, some good coaches. Uh, you've got a new league starting this year here. XFL starting back up and they brought it and they're bringing a team to Orlando. That's right. Yep. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see with two secondary leagues. Now they're competing at the same time. I mean, you got the USFL and you got the XFL and there's only so much entertainment dollar to go around. All those True. Are, there is no other team in this city, or I don't think there's any crossover as far as teams in either league and in the, in the cities. Uh, last year, the USFL was all in Birmingham. Supposedly, they're going to their towns that they're respectively play for. So we'll see how that goes. They've got TV rights, which is huge. Um, and, uh, Americans are going to watch football all the time. I don't care what you say. It's a, if the game's on, we're flowing it on and, and watching it. So I think it's great for the players to give them an opportunity to be visible, put some film together for NFL teams to watch and uh, have an opportunity to live out their dream. So I do think there's a need for it. Uh, but again, the NFL has no desire to try and be a part of it financially. Well, not just players too, but I think coaches as well. And that brings me to my next question, because you had a young 26 year old running backs coach on your staff in uh, Sacramento named Mike McDaniel, yeah. who is now the head coach of the Miami dolphins. Uh, tell me it, Tell me about what you knew. Tell me about the young wet behind the ears, Mike McDaniel, that you knew in California. He's still wet behind the ears. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember the first time Denny brought us out to San Diego. Denny lived in San Diego for a staff meeting. He flew us all, the, the coaches' staff, our first year. And, and uh, I got a chance to meet Mike. And, you know, here guy went to Yale. He was about the size of a peanut. And, uh, of course, he had a, a pedigree, having worked with the Texans and been around the Broncos and the Shanahans. And so that part was impressive. But he was a tremendously intelligent guy. I mean, I, when he talked, it was amazing. And he knew it, he knew his stuff about football for being such a young coach. He was really, really good. He coached the running backs for us and, and uh, left going into my third year to go back to uh, Washington with Kyle with his father and uh but has done an incredible job with the dolphins uh a great guy players loved him got a tremendous sense of humor doesn't take things not that he doesn't take things serious it just doesn't show you know he lets things roll off his back and go about his business but he is very very good with what he does offensively and managing staffs and players based on what i've just seen i mean this year was yeah. the dolphins Seems to seems to take his job very seriously, but doesn't take himself overly seriously. Good analogy. Exactly. Yeah. He's done a tremendous job with Tua, you know, uh, instilling confidence in him that he's the guy. And that really is a quarterback is really, really important. You can't be looking over your shoulder every time you make a mistake. And McDaniel has already made that point that he is my guy. And he's yeah. played he's played exceptionally well in most of the games. So hopefully he can stay healthy. So once you send Mike McDaniel off into the sunset, <laughs> uh, you 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 come back to Central Florida. And I remember your press conference when you were hired as the head coach of Trinity Prep, and um, and you've been there for the better part of a decade now. And you know, mm -hmm. what 
led you to decide to, you know, I mean, you, you played in the NFL, you coached in the NFL, you played and coached college. What led you to kind of settle in as a high school coach? Well, I, uh, you know, my last year in college was at the University of Massachusetts in uh, 2012, and that was not a great experience for me. Um, I was up there with the 111 team. I got hired as a coordinator and did nothing as far as responsibility as a coordinator, and I had two freshmen that were playing. We had just stepped up to FBS level, and I'd already been through this before, but now we're playing Michigan, and it's just – it wasn't a lot of fun. You know, that's a, that's a tough program to succeed at. So, and, you know, I went to college in, on the other side of the state in Boston. Mm. We played UMass every year. And uh, they weren't good then, and they, we weren't very good then, at the, you know, in 2012. So I had a conversation with the head coach and came home. I just, so the job at Trinity opened up, and I – only live across the street and uh, have been obviously a part of the Trinity thing, coaching at uh, UCF all the time. So I got to know those people over there. So I just said, well, you know, I'm going to take a shot at this. And, um, I had tried to be, be a head coach again in 2012 and thought I had a chance at it, but didn't get it. So that's why I went to UMass because I had turned that down. So I said, no, nah, I'm going to get back in there. Uh, coaching at the high school level and see how that, see how it goes. And now 10 years later, I'm still there. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, during this time at Trinity prep, you ended up coming across two brothers by with the last name, a holler, Alec and yes. Max, who are now both with the, with the Knights. And of course, Alec producing the highlight teasman. What is, what does it mean to you to see the, the two of them end up going to college at the program you once coached? It's a unique situation, and I tell you what, it's it was an honor to have them as players for Trinity, for me to coach them, and then to have the opportunity to be able to watch them just down the street six miles is, is fantastic, uh, especially at a place that I spent most of my life coaching at. So uh, kind of a unique situation, but it's, it's one that has benefited both those kids and the UCF program and myself as a fan. So it's uh, it, it, it I, I can't say enough about the family. He's got mom and dad are phenomenal, and both young men are upstanding, outstanding character guys that work pretty hard. Alec Holler has had quite the year and a half for himself. He managed to get on scholarship a year and a half ago, and then this season produced two of arguably the best highlights of the season in the Holler Hop and the Holy Holler. What, what was your reaction to seeing those plays live for the first time? Because those were, those were ridiculous. Well, I, it didn't shock me. I can remember the first time he came on the field. We had already started the season as a junior, his junior year, and we were already through two games. And I'd seen him as a basketball player, but he came out to practice and he's running routes and he's catching the ball effortlessly. He had great feet, great movement. Uh, and I'm just thinking, this guy, what a natural you know, so catching the football to me for him was something that he could, it was like breathing, you know. So the catches were remarkable in themselves, but it doesn't shock me that he, he made those catches at that time. Uh, I don't think any moment's too big for him. I really don't. Uh, he was recruited as a senior, uh, overlooked by BCS schools, mostly FCS schools. He said, Coach, I can play at the BCS level. I go, I know you can, but he goes, I'm going to go to UCF. So I called uh, Byron Lawson and uh, Sean Beckton at the time. They agreed to allow him to be a preferred walk-on. The thing that really impresses me about Alex is his tenacity, his belief in his own ability to get things done. Uh, went there as a preferred walk-on uh, for his ACL and still fought through that injury to not only earn a scholarship, he become the tight end uh, for that program, the starting tight end. And a part of that, when he started playing tight end for me, the, the running of routes was a, seemed to be a very instinctive thing for him. It was the blocking part of it that was different. So 
being a basketball player, it's a little different when you have to stick your nose in there and knock somebody off the line of scrimmage. And uh, what he's done at UCF is remarkable as far as a block is concerned. Yeah, so, boxing out, box out doesn't work on the gridiron. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> you mentioned that you ha- at Trinity, you've, you've had to, like, find players to be on your team with Trinity. Is that right? You mentioned that earlier? Well, we're always trying to uh, persuade kids that go to school there. We can't recruit. We don't do any of that. It's just trying to get the kids that are already there playing other sports to play. So you you mentioned that you know it was in the middle of the, his, of his junior season that he started playing for you for you guys. So what is it like for you to be able to find a talent like that at that sort of time? Well, it, it came at a, a phenomenal time. I mean, we had all the pieces in, in place except for that position. And I use Alec a lot like Malzahn and everybody else does. He's a move guy for me. You know, he's not a guy that's going to stick his hand to the ground. He's 6'5", 260 pounds, come off and knock you off the ball. So he was perfect for what we did. And I think that was part of the reason why I was attracted at UCF. But getting him the third game of the year, I think he caught four or five balls against Episcopal up in Jacksonville, uh, did a phenomenal job, had a great junior year, uh, but he was still off the radar as a recruit and then had an incredible senior year. Um, But to get him when I did is all thankful to his brother. His brother's the one who talked him into playing, Max, his younger brother. It wasn't, it wasn't any coach. I watched him play basketball, and he, he didn't want to have anything to do with football. And all of a sudden, he shows up for practice one day. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> and, and now he's going to be playing for his sixth season next year at UCF. Um, you, you mentioned that you actually talked with Alec about that decision, right? I certainly did. His father, and, and he called me about what I thought. And uh, so I... Put him, I gave him some advice about the information he needs to make the decision, to make a, you know, uh, the proper decision for his own career. And, um, you know, Alec is a hardworking guy. Um, he's not the biggest as far as weight's concerned, um, although he does things incredibly well. Um, I don't know that the, the, the NFL scouts had him on their, their radar. Um, my first thing was I said, listen, you've got to get somebody and get information from scouts that have evaluated you and judge from their opinion about your draftability and where you fall. And uh, he did that and got the information. He shared it with me. I talked to his father about it. and um, He made the right choice, uh, without a doubt, for himself and for UCF. I think that uh, he'll have he'll have an opportunity to go in the National Football League and do very very well. Whether it's a move tight end, tight end, special teams guy, he'll he'll have an opportunity to live out his dream. And he'll be playing for UCF when they make their way into the Big Twelve Conference. And, like, I, and we're going to wrap up here in a second, but I got to ask you, Coach, the when you look at where UCF is now on the, you know having just played their final season in the American athletic conference from where the program was when you started to where it's going, what, how do you feel about it? How do you think about it? I I think this was predicted a long time ago. I made a statement I may have made it to Alan Smock, Alan Smocky. Uh, I remember Alan. Or Mike Bianchi. I forget what year it was. It may have been 2003 or t- 2002. I still have the newspaper article. It was a USA Today or something. I said, this football team will win a national championship. I gave the reasons. I said, Florida, Florida State, Miami have all won. We are in the, the best geographical location, economical location. Uh, it's got everything working for it. And there's not a reason. I said, I'm, I didn't say we're going to win it next year. It may be 20 years, but they will have an opportunity to play for the national championship sometime. 
Uh, I think that moving into the Big 12 obviously gives them the chance to accomplish that. And there is no reason why they can't get to that, you know, get to that, that point. I just, the money dump that's been dumped into that program, the facilities, uh, the size of the school. I mean, I, I guess they're turning kids away now that are trying to get accepted in the UCF. I mean, when I was there, there were 14,000 students. I was about 160. <laughs> so, yeah, it seems know. like it's gone up oh, about tenfold. <laughs> I, I don't recognize campus, so I don't drive up there very often, but they've got everything in place that any student athlete, the top ones would love to be a part of. And with this portal now, you can get rich fast. You get a couple guys that fit in. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's yeah. just remarkable. Now, you can lose some guys, too, as we've seen with UCF, but it's going to be across the board. You're going to get your guys in. And uh, so they're going to have an opportunity. I think they'll do extremely well. Looking forward to it. But you asked the question. I, I saw this a long time ago coming. So I'm yeah. very how do you view how do you view your place in the program's history? Well, I, I, I think that I had an effect, a positive effect on the, the growth of the program uh, with the players. Um, I, you know, I was blessed by the Lord to have a chance to be there that long and work with a, a great group of coaches, men, and, and coach some incredible young student athletes. So I, I think that I have gratification in knowing that I was a part of building the program um, with a group of guys that probably doesn't don't get the credit for it. Like you said, it's a it's a younger generation now that's involved with UCF that doesn't really uh, understand the past or maybe not embrace it as much. But when you've seen things through my eyes from when it first started up and 85 when I got there, obviously Don Jonas did a remarkable job with not having a whole lot when he started that program as the first coach. Um, and all those guys prior to me getting there had a part of it. But that program's where it's at because of the guys' sacrifice that they made to make something that was nothing special. Yeah. I, and it's, it's remarkable when you think about the only school in – what will be eventually the power it in eventually the power five that has played football at every level of the NCAA division three, two, one, double a FCS FBS. And now, um, and now heading into a power five conference and coach, I, I can speak certainly personally. And I know I speak for a lot of people that, um, that I am thankful for, the role that you played in developing UCF into what it is and also in developing people like me. Cause I was a young cub student reporter, you know, showing up to press conferences when, when you were a head coach and asking st stupid questions. And I'm, and I'm sure that, you know, maybe that hasn't changed all that much over the years, but, um, but I'm thankful for the opportunities that you gave me and all of our friend, Eric Lopez and, Matt Dunaway and Matt Itell and a number of other guys who um, who, are, who had successful careers who who didn't play for you but interacted with you and we're really thankful for that because um, because you did treat us like we were like like we were one of our own and we felt and you gave us a lot of confidence and I think that that like you've mentioned when it talks about playing it's not just in terms of playing sports it's also in terms of everything confidence is just a tremendous. Um, is I think an underappreciated factor in learning how to be good at anything. And I'm thankful for that. Well, I thank you, Jeff, for all you do. Uh, you're, you're the a mouthpiece for the, the, the programs, the, the athletic programs there. And you do a remarkable job of representing UCF and the great things that are going on and doing the research and, and, and letting people know about, okay, the past and what's going on and getting people on that can share their experiences. So I thank you for your dedication to the school, which has been substantial. I mean, that's a long time. You've been yeah, there. I know. You like Mark I, I know. Know well, Oh, Mark, Mark has been there way longer than me. He's got <laughs> some really good stories. I know. Oh, I, I, I feel like I'm a, I'm still a relative late comer. You know, <laughs> it's, I only got, I only got one year of one, a independent football under my belt. You guys have a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great person. Another one that, you know, is, is special, but you know, 
you're in that same category and, and in representing UCF is a big deal and doing it in a positive way. And I know as you move down the road in the Big 12, you guys are going to have a blast. I think it's, uh, it'll be something special. Well, we're looking forward to it, Coach. Thank you so much. Thank that you. means a lot to hear from you. And, uh, hey, uh, when are we going to get you out to another game here? How often do you come out? Well, I was talking to Bryson uh, this week a little bit. Um, the last game I was at, my son was on the team playing quarterback. Before. Right, Garrett. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I think it was South Carolina State. And, uh, you know, as the season went on, um, he and I talked about, you know, putting film together so I could get out of there because it was apparent that McKenzie was going to be the guy. So that was the last game. I don't know, 2000 and I don't know. 16, 17? 16. 17. Yep. Yep. All right. That's 16. too long, Coach. We got to <laughs> we got to get you back home. We got Dante back home. We got to get you back home here too to come uh, to come hang with us and and uh, and yeah. see what you and again see what you have been certainly no small part in building here at UCF. We thank you for that. And we thank you for Appreciate the you. Man, We went super long, but you know what? That's this is, this is fun. I, thank you for your time. Thank you. Is, oh, thank you. I don't talk about this stuff ever. So to have <laughs> the opportunity to talk with you and Bryson and share what I do remember from those days, uh, someone that does care like yourself is, is really, really important to me. So it was uh, very special for me also. You got it, Coach. Coach right. Mike Kruzak at Trinity Prep, former UCF head coach. Merry Christmas, Coach. Happy New Year, and uh, we'll see you back here on campus pretty soon, okay? All right. Merry Christmas, and have a blessed holiday season.